Hi guys, welcome back to The Big Shift where we bring you unbelievably raw and detailed content about unbelievable people and unbelievable life journeys with fascinating stories to tell. Today I've got a, a guy with an unbelievable story. He's a, a police whistleblower who is at a really high level of detective constable. He certainly knows a lot of guys that I know from back in the day and he's got an unbelievable story to tell. He's a brave guy because he's come out and he's really lifted the veil. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce John Wedger. Hi, John. How are you doing? Thanks for coming on. Hello, Stephen. It's an absolute pleasure. Sorry about the venue. I've, uh, I'm in a van, but it's all right. It's, it, it's a pseudo office and it's warm. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to be troubled. If I go indoors, I'm going to... Uh, so many people come and go, you know, I'll end up being dyspraxic. But here, it's a place of solitude. So I do apologise for, uh, for the venue. That's all. No worries, John. I mean, the important thing here is the content, right? And we're yeah. going to get right into it. Now, look, we've talked before and you've got some unbelievable stories to tell. Let's start about you as a detective constable and you was mixing with a lot of high-ranking police officers, it's fair to say, in the day. You see a lot of dark yeah. stuff. I mean, look, you know, we're not saying there are good guys and bad guys in every, in every, in every organisation, right? We're talking about the rotten apples here, which was hidden and protected to all extents and all that. So tell us about, tell us about some of the really dark stuff that started to change your life because I know that you was doing a lot of work protecting people and then when you got into a certain area it really got very dark didn't it John so let's just go straight for it tell yeah. us about that well well, the, the police what people got to understand is wheels within wheels right uh, and initially when you join you, you know you, you put through a training process which is very military based in its origins you know so you, you, you you're made to march the, the, the uh, fellas who take you for drill are, are guardsmen, you know, from the guards regiments. The, the chaps that take you for the physical education, they're from the Army uh, PT Corps, you know, and it, it was what's classed as a disciplined service back in that day. Although it's a civilian police force, it, it was very much um, military-style discipline. And it changes you. It changes you. It's an indoctrination. So my basic training was five months. And the person who walked through the gates at the world famous Hendon um, or infamous Hendon Police Training uh, College was a different to the guy who walked out. Um, I, I, I didn't like the training very much. I didn't like it was it was an it was an alien environment for me, uh, full of a lot of sycophants and very false environment. Um, but it did change me as a person. And you know, of course, I was proud. I, I passed out there. My family were proud, and I then had a career you know, by all intents and purposes, was going to see me through to old age and, and will be exciting and will pay the way. And I saw myself as one of the good guys out there to do good things. So my ideology was, and my heart was in the right place. But then you go on the street and, and there's two different worlds. There's a uniform constable and there is the detective um, side of things. They're totally different worlds. If you, if you take Europe, a lot of countries in Europe they're, they're not interchangeable. You either join as a detective or you join as, as, as an, a uniformed officer. You, you know, never the twain shall meet. Whereas uh, the British police is totally different and the Commonwealth police is different. So you, you must do two years in uniform before you can progress, specialise or move on to the detective branch. Um, I went to South East London. Uh, it was very raw. It was the early 90s. A lot of the fellas um, that I joined with, there had been a massive deficit in recruitment for many, many years. So they just started getting home office funding for more recruits because people weren't. And I think because of the boom in construction industry throughout the, the 80s and into the 90s, um, people were going towards money rather than they were going towards policing because policing uh, wasn't really seen as a, a so way of making just, a lucrative living. Just to come in there, John. Absolutely. Yeah. I get that. So... You know, you join up, you think you're one of the good guys. And look, you know, I certainly know, as you've said, in, 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 in the UK police force, you have to go through the ranks, as it were. So you go through the ranks. So what are we talking in that period where you're fresh-faced, you come out, you do all your normal stuff until that first bit of darkness, until you start seeing 
something else. Was this was this towards where you'd been promoted and you was getting this? Yeah, no, no, it happened straight. It happened straight away because okay. you go on the street. You know, when I went to an area that, that was very, very violent and had a bad reputation, and you went out, and these coppers, were, they were like street warriors, you know. They, they were very brave, some of them, but some of them were like dogs, and they were attack dogs, and it was very violent. And the first thing you're met with is violence. And, you know, and if someone didn't play ball, wallop, they got it. They got a smash in, right? And then all of a sudden, you'd be presented with an evidence book by, by a senior colleague, copy that. And so straight away, you're bearing false witness. And one of the things the police teach you to, teach you to do, and any cop who says I haven't do, done this is an out-and-out out liar, is that they lie. They mm. lie. Like social services lie, like the police mm. lie. You bear false witness from the moment you walk in to the moment you leave. You know, there will be a lie in the evidential chain somewhere along the line. Some people, as my career went on, I didn't want to be part of that. Others, they made a career out of lying and out of violence. And they become very organised in what they did. And therefore, them units had to be specialist and they had to be away from the other ones. They had to be elitist because you can't have anyone just walking in and ruining your little clique. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, you know, we're going back to the days of con uh, contemporaneous no, I said that right. It's of like course, the yeah. Right. But look, you know, I mean, I certainly, people who know my story, we're going to go right into the flying squad and what happened in my trial and the corruption. This is all in books. It's it's out there. It's It's been catalogued. I can talk about it because I was served with these paperwork. Paperwork, right? We're going to get into that later about these specialist squads, right? So... We were talking about them times, and of course they would they would get the notes together, right, John? Back in the day, the yeah, wrong yeah, ones, yeah. and say we're going to say this and then twist the evidence. So yeah, I'm following yeah, you. you, right. you know, this is and what what happened. I'll give you an example. Again, I'm in no way going to put myself in a position where later in court I've got to answer to my actions by what I'm saying now. But um, uh, a guy had escaped from prison. He was over the side from prison. And he was in a minicab with his friend. And they were heroin addicts, crack cocaine addicts. And they, they were burglars, you know. They used to call it drumming back then. And, mm. they were, and they would, a lot of them would use minicabs, would move them about from place to place. And this minicab gets stopped um, in South East London. Me and my, my colleague stops him. He, he knew the streets. He knew the people. And he said, that guy, uh, back passenger seat, um, he's wanted. His name is so-and-so. Get him out. And, and, and see see where you go from there. Anyway, get him out. Very, very quiet. Not, you know, an amenable fella. And um, I said, what's your name? And he comes up with this, this bizarre name. And he said, look, I've been in trouble in the past, but I'm not known. Check me out on the radio. So I went to check him out on the radio. And the next thing, my friend starts fighting with his friend. And with that, this guy just headbutts me in the face. Right, I go down and he, he sort of lays a boot in and then I managed to get it up and then we end up having, it was, it was like a school fight, you know? It was like two two teams from two schools fighting. So it was me smashing him and him smashing me and my friend doing likewise. And the one thing I, I, I was sort of said at training school, you're going to get into a roll around. It's going to happen. Now, I was I was in the police wrestling team and, and that will come apparent a bit later. Um how, how that ties in. I did wrestling for the police and I was quite good at it. I was quite a fit lad. Um, I swam for him as well and wrestled. And um, so in the end, I got the better of him because his fitness was bad because he was a junkie, you know. But he, he knew how to fight. And all of a sudden, I was covered in blood and, and whatnot. But he'd taken a few clumps. And he said to me, look, fair's fair. Enough's enough. And he said, you know, you fight like a man. I give up. You've best me. So we shook hands. But my friend had put up an urgent call. Now, when you put up an urgent assistance call, the world and their brother turn up, right? And when they turn up back in their days, it's going to get nasty. Used to turn up, right? Oh yeah. yeah and, and we used to have these old Sherpa-style vans, mm. like post office vans, and they used to hose them down at the end of a the night. They would hose them because there was claret everywhere, yeah. you know. And they had like a, you know, these bench seats with a gully in the middle. Anyway, this van turned up. This guy gets flung in the back. I get taken back to the police station. And he's then presented um, at uh, the, the custody suite. And the van's been rolling about a little bit on the way. So he's had a few knocks in the back of the van. 
and he gets thrown out the back. I'm there. I take him through the custody suite, but I'm covered in blood. And it's the summer, and I've got this uh, short sleeve shirt on, and there's blood all down it. And the sergeant went, what happened to you? And I went, oh, oh we had a bit of a fight, but it, it, it's all sorted. And he went, no, 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 no. When, when you're in a state like that, it's not sorted. You go down, you have a shower, you clean up, new shot on, you back here in five minutes, right? I went, okay, now do it. Anyway, I went back down, had a shower, come back. By the time I come back, an ambulance was on its way. They, they, they smashed him to pieces. And then, of course, the, uh, the, the, the notes are thrown in front of us and said, right, there's your evidence, copy that. So the guy, um, he, he gets battered. He ends up in court. And he gets found guilty. and But he stands up in court and he turns around and he says to the judge, they're lying. The police are lying. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying I did or I didn't lie. All right. I've got to make that clear. You've got to read between the lines on all of this. Um, yeah, you know, you know, uh, for obvious reasons. Anyway, yeah. um, and he turned around to the judge <laughs> and he said, that lad, I liked him. And he said, I know he's new, but I thought the police had changed. He said, he fought me like a bloke. And it was it squared up. I was coming along anyway, but what happened after that, they're all lying. And he went away. He got sentenced and he went away. Thought nothing of it. And this is a, a bit of a thing that sort of changed a lot in the way I, I ended up operating. And, and that's why I worked a lot on my own. It was a bit later. Um, I'm in a garage, an all-night garage um, near the old Kent Road in South East London. And I'm just buying some milk. And he's just been released from prison. Mm. That and he's walked straight into me and he's with his mates and he pulls out a knife and he sticks it straight in my throat and that's it and he holds me there right a knife point and his mates going what's going on what's going on he went that's the one who put me away and they went jerk him stab him you know and he went he looked at me and I was petrified and I went please don't please don't you know you know I wasn't blubbing but I, I was frightened and I said you don't need to do this and he turned around and he said, no, I don't. He said, listen, I liked you. He said, I hope you've learned a lesson. He said, you don't need to be like the rest of them. And he put the knife away and he, he let me go. You know, and, and it was it was a bit of a change in, in my attitude, you know. Um, but where I was in South East London, it, it, was, it was sort of like the game. That's how the game was. When you turned up at a scene, they expected a fight and you expected them to fight you. So it was, it was a matter of who could get, you know, the first punch in. You know, and there was a notorious police station down there called Carter Street. Listen, do you know what? I was just about to say yeah. that. From our end, back in the days, you know, it's like prisons. There was notorious yeah. flagships, if you want yeah. to call it, where there'd be, like, the bully boys or the heavy mob. Yeah. They'd be specifically chosen, you know, and you'd get the treatment in there, John, and Carter yeah, Street. Yeah. I was just saying yeah. about Carter Street. Yeah. That was... That was one and, 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 known about I mean, the old days. I, I didn't work out Cart Street, but I was I was neighbouring to Cart Street, and um, but a lot of the, the people. Stoke Newington was another one. Started well, to get I was just going to say that there, there was four of them in each corner. So South East London at Cart Street. Cart Street. The, the West End had Paddington. Paddington. The Har- yeah. It was a Harrow Road. Nick Harrow Road was mm. one. Um, uh, Stoke Newington was was on the east side, and Wandsworth was down in the southwest side, and they were all sort of synonymous with if you go in there you're going to get a kick in i mean carter street was by far the worst because brutal. they you know, very brutal and they had a lot of deaths in there and yeah, they a lot of deaths they built a new nick and they changed its name to woolworth and i think within its first week because they changed the building but they didn't change the staff within the first week someone died um in, in the custody there was suspicious you know um so the, the mentality carried on and it was and then you had certain units that if you turned up, you were going to get a kick in. And one of them was the flying squad, mm-hmm. you know? And and a lot of them were fellas that had, um, were rugby players. They were picked from the rugby squad um, or they were boxers because the police had a very good boxing team. You know, they used to fight the army every year and they were, they were pretty successful. And rugby, they were very good at rugby because it goes along hand in hand with the job title. And they had things like, a bit before my time, they had the special patrol group Mm. which went on to the TSG, the Territorial Support Group. And, you know, and when these fellas turned up, that was their job. But, you know, but sometimes they need it because it can be a very brutal job and not everyone on the outside is nice. 
Yeah, let me, <laughs> let me let me come in the Joanna bit about the flying squad, right? Now, the flying squad, back in the day from our way, what I was, you know, and I was, I was, I went away for armed robbery. I was a cat, eh? Three times I had three, three trials at the Old Bailey for armed robbery, right? So I was, I was part of that world, as people know, for many years, right? You know, and I went away. And for us on the other side of it, John, you know, the flying squad specifically was the ones, you know, because of the armed robbery and yeah. the gangster problem. You had rig approach, you had um, uh, the tower, bridge. tower bridge, you know, you yeah. had... Um, Barnes, Barnes yeah, was Barnes, the other one. Yeah, Barnes, Barnes was the other Finchley, one. Finchley, and Finchley. Yeah, and Finchley, Finchley was the yeah. other one. So they, you know, they they carved up London. Now, for us, it was rig approach, right? Yeah. You know, and when I finally got arrested in this cat, cat and mouse game, I mean, the flying squad you're talking about... You know, you're talking about an elite squad. You know, they're armed. They're like, you know, elite squad on their own. They don't answer to no one. They're given the utmost resources, all the best kit. You know, you're probably talking, I mean, you know, when I got the paperwork after, when the ghost squad went into rig approach and they found fit-up kits in there, guns, all this stuff. I mean, I was served this paperwork legally because my case at the old pa Bailey, we screamed fit-up that they move stuff in our case. It's a fact. Five years into that sentence, the ghost squad went into rig approach. So I was served the depositions, me and my me and my co-defendants legally. And um, we had all the we had all the information about what was said about the ghost squad going in there, finding fit up squid uh, kits, gloves, uh replicas, all this stuff. They was putting it on people. It said this is what the Police complaints were saying if they wouldn't find firearms, they were shooting people in good faith, what they were saying. But what they were saying in there is basically of the 25 or so officers that was in there, none of them went away, I've got to say. They was all put off on uh, medical grounds mostly. Yeah. But all this was in the depositions, legally stated to us, right, and disclosed to us. You know, it said that, look, you know, the culture within Rig Approach Center, and there are books out about this now, John. It's all out, it's all out in the public domain, right? Yeah. Was, there was a nucleus of five that was the hardcore, and the rest was turning the other cheeks. They well, was condoning it, and they was complicit, right? But well, we, well, knew, well, well, we knew well, some of these as I did, right? Yeah, well, what happens is, I mean... A lot of the practices, I never had a major problem with it at the time, right? Because it, it, because there was no need for me to... I never got involved on the early years with the corruption because I was a uniformed cop, I didn't have to. But you knew that the detectives were different. There was a different current, undercurrent going on in their world and they were quite a different breed. And um, I'd always aspire to be a detective because I'm a bit of a loner, like working on my own. And I like investigating and I found uniform work very monotonous and a bit bottom end. And really there, there was no independent thought put into it. Um, I ended up on child abuse, but you know, there was a reason why I went there, why, why life took me there. And I'm, I'm so grateful I did go in. It was seen as a girl's job, but it was very much not. It's a, a worthwhile a, 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 job, John. An easy option. Well, you know, and we're going to get to that. We're yeah. talking about yeah. vulnerable people here who certainly need a lot of protection, of right? Course. There were some dark, yeah, and dark people out there, right? Yeah. But look, listen, just, uh, John, I just want to go back uh, to the flying squad a little bit. Well, we well, well, about... well, I can... Oh, right, yeah, sorry. I can, come, on. I can come on to this because what happened was I, I, I got in quite a bit of trouble when I was a young copper, only because I didn't really know their rules. And it wasn't... It was mainly um, to do with... I, I couldn't adjust to their lifestyle and, you know... But nothing wrong, nothing naughty, nothing wrong. Um, and I was just a nice bloke and, and people liked me and I was very good on the street and I ended up compromising myself quite a bit. And uh, so they gave me a second chance and they sent me to the West End. Now, this is where the, my, my, my whole world changed because I ended up going to Belgravia Police Station, which I thought was just like a little sleepy hollow. But what I didn't realise was Belgravia Police Station was under constant surveillance by what you term the ghost squad, Right. CIB, um, the, you know, the Corruption Investigation Branch, right? They had, at the back of the police station, it's um, just at the back of Victoria Coach Station, there's there's flats, and these flats are owned by the police. So they had all the um, the, the, the anti-corruption police 
uh, they, they occupied a whole floor of this building and they had surveillance on the back door of Belgravia Nick. And Belgravia Nick had, um, it was the first police station to have swipe card access. So they, and every single phone was being monitored. And I never really knew why. And I, I went in as uniform copper there and I was very quickly, I was sort of um, selected to go as a trainee detective. And I ended up in, in the CID office and this was like a who's who of corrupt coppers. And it had um, basically um, every single sort of main player that was under investigation, either from the from the Southeast Regional Crime Squad out of um, East Dulwich mm. or the Rig Approach. Um, I don't think, I think we had a few from Barnes. It was mainly the Regional Crime Squad and Rig Approach. They All the uh, um, DSs and DIs were shoved into... Um, Belgravia CID, you know, and all of a sudden, um, over um, over a period of about I don't know three months, most of them got arrested. They all went all of the, their desks, were, you know, they would come in at night, they shut down the office, their desks would be uh, taken away. They would even take down the whole desk because the police desk got this black um, sort of like vinyl covering, and there's a reason for it because whatever they write down imprints on the vinyl. So they take that way and they can even see what they've written down from the imprint on this vinyl. Um, they were taking lockers away and virtually the whole CID was decimated over this three months period. And it turned out that, you know, they were all being brought in for, for drug dealing, uh, links to armed robberies. I mean, one of the main ones was that there was a group of them were taking people out on um, production orders from prison. So they were taking a prisoner out. To, to do what they call the TICs, taking mm. into considerations. Yeah. Uh, they'd take that out an armed blagger for the day, but and he would go round and he'd pick out the crimes, which is a crime in itself because they were clearing up all their mates' crimes. But what was also happening, they were taking out armed robbers and getting them to do armed robberies. Yeah, that's so, craziness. But there you go, yeah, you know, this yeah, is yeah, the so, so the arm, Yeah, the armed robber gets away with it because he said, how could I? I was with DS and DC so-and-so. And the cop was going, well, a stupid thing, but they were, and there was one little group were going out. These were detectives. They, um, in their lunch break, they were going around, uh, CDs had just come out, compact discs and DVDs, and they were worth a lot of money. They, they were going out um, with um, uh, kiting with credit cards, and they were shoplifting for DVDs in their lunch breaks. Three other lads were going out to Switzerland, France, and Germany, obviously not in a lunch break, but on little breaks, and doing armed robberies, coppers doing armed robberies. Um, there was there was coppers that had nicked drugs and sold it on. But one of the main one, and he was a DI, and it was very lucrative. And what they were doing was getting informants, getting them to give over the information, and the informant would get paid cash back then, right? Get paid cash. And they were keeping the lion's share of the money. So when they did the um, the cash handover, sometimes they'd give them two keys and it'd be in a safe deposit box. One guy, you know, the criminal will get one key, the old bill will get the other. They both go together and they'd go and get their money out, you know. Um, so it was it was sterile, but the old bill were keeping the lion's share of the money and it was untraceable, mm -hmm. you know. And that was going on hell of a lot. Now, what happened once was um, the, 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 the DI we had, he was a great big guy, Um and he was well known that if he didn't like her, he'd just punch her, right? He, was, he, he had a terrible reputation and he was ex-regional crime squad. And we had a detective sergeant, was, was a really nice bloke. And he, this, this detective sergeant had screwed up on, on a, a witness protection somewhere along the line. And we'd all gone out for like this office lunch um, and a drinks and, and all that. And this, um, this DI took the DS, just said, can I have a quick word with you outside? We went outside. And this DI, detective inspector, punched this DS so hard in the, in the face that his um, uh, cheekbone shattered and went into his eye and um, rendered his eye useless and then just laid it, left him on the floor. I mean, he, he brutalised the guy. And, that, and what happened to, be to that? Off. I mean, John, nothing, look, you know, there you nothing, go. Nothing, nothing ever happened. A broad daylight. If that was yeah. someone else to do that, a member of the public, yeah. God forbid anyone else who's a little bit at it, you know they would have threw the book at them. Right, so well, well, of course, he's, well, well, he's right ranking officers. So, what happened? Everyone's complicit, everyone sees in broad daylight. Yeah. What happened? Absolutely nothing. And, and another time, um, 
we went round and um, did a warrant. And our our detective sergeant, he he come from the flying squad. He was um, he was an undercover fellow on the flying squad, and he was also uh, a DS there. And he had a thing that whenever we went in the house, um, whatever man was there, he headbutted him. And so he'd just go up to someone, he would just headbutt him straight in the face, you know. And that was his thing. That's what he did. You know, he'd always done it. But I would say he was he was a phenomenal investigator, and he actually mm. wasn't a bad bloke. But um, but that was his thing. It was just brutal, very very brutal, you know. And it was later. Um, I can remember someone telling me that the uh, the TV series um, the Sweeney was based on on real life coppers back in the day, the sixties and the seventies from the Flying Squad, and um, they had to remove it. Uh, I don't know what whether it was. Uh, Granada TV or whatever. I had to remove the program because of peer pressure. Because too many coppers were copying Jack Regan, and you would always see on people's desks little cutouts of Jack Regan, and it'd be "Get your trousers on, your knit." And that was, you know, so. They, and later on, the one that they also used to idolise was um, Gene Hunt, you know, from Life on Mars, and that brought back that that pulled the brutality back in as well. So everyone wanted to be like Gene Hunt, you know, or me, Jack look, Regan. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? You know, the people have been there. Let's just face it there. Basically, people with a responsibility to maintain the law, right? I mean, let's just really be pragmatic yeah. about this. They have a lot of responsibility. But look, going back to the flying squad, now look, you know, we know some of the names there. They're all out. They're all out there. I'm not going to start talking about names now. People well, can well, research can get, really, really easy. Get, get the there book, was a DI. The Untouchables. Yeah, the you know, yeah. there was a DI there. No, I, it was well known. It was a wrestler, Scottish guy that can go out yeah, there. Yeah, I know, I know exactly what it is. He's yeah. even in my book, John, in my book, yeah. The Monkey Buzzle Tree, with a film coming out. It's yeah. depicted in there under a different name. But his name's everywhere anyway. There's book, yeah, there's book yeah, yeah. about this. So tell us, tell us a little bit about this really in-house little group in rig approach in the old days when I was active, who was shooting people, who was moving evidence, who who was cool at all the corruption, planting guns on people, taking money from armed robberies. They was moving stuff. We know this. Tell us a bit about the dynamic, because you knew some of these guys, John, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of them was a really good friend of mine, um, and he was an undercover uh, lad at rig approach. And they, they actually wanted him to go... Um, undercover against his own team and he wouldn't um so they ended up the anti-corruption lot destroyed this guy he, he tried to commit suicide um but but what you had was, was an elite little unit you know and in order to get in there but there was high rewards because you're dealing with, with money that no one knows about you know this is unaccounted for money mm. you know so what happens to it you know i'm not saying that they're all thieves and all that but a lot of the investigation was going into them keeping a percentage of the money, you know, and especially the informant money. So one, the one scam that, that I knew about was the informant money, how the, the informant money was, was being halved or even not, you know, 60 40 um, on that. Um, they were dealing with a lot of cash in transit. So again, it, it's all used notes. It's all used cash. Now, were they were they taxing the criminals? Well, that's exactly what the allegation was, and and these are guys like you said. One of them, what was a Commonwealth wrestler, you know, um, a tough guy, and had a very tough so reputation behind the him. Day amongst you know all the people yeah. of the day. Yeah, the, the the guy that that I worked under, he would he was well known for going toe to toe with a villain. You know, he, they would take their shirts off, you know, and, and they'd have it, you know, and that was his thing. If, if, you, if he turns up, you're going to get smashed. So you, you had this um, uh, peer pressure of an extreme violence that went with it. You know, like I said, a lot of these guys w w were accomplished rugby players. A lot had come out of the military as well, you know, and a lot had come w were good boxers. So you've got a tough little squad. You've got a very, very tasty little unit. Now, unfortunately, what happens is you might not start off with bad intention, you, you know, you might want to put these bad guys in prison, these armed robbers. And what there's nothing more sexy than, than, than you know, taking on an armed robber and, and taking them down, you know? You know, 
with, with instant rewards, huge amounts of cash and, and everything else. It's, you know, it's, it's what, you, you know, these, these films like the Sweeney are made of. It, you know, it's, it's an iconic thing to be doing. And it's what people really uh, saw as, as, as the elite, the SAS of the police. Yeah. But, but I mean, unfortunately... Just to come in there, John, just for the viewers, look, even, even back in the day, you know, Flatfoot's how you should be called. Just to people who who hadn't had any specialist training or big experience, you know, or was up the ladder and all that stuff. The Flying Squad, you know, it's gone on now, you know, went on to be soccer, National Crime Squad, all these different units for organised crime. But they was the organised crime people of the day, the gangster problem, all the rest of it. And they were seen, one, Regional Crime Squad was another one, but it was kind of, the Flying Squad was very, very elite. They was looked at the very pinnacle of what a copper could be, wasn't it? Pretty much. Well, no, 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 no one could adjudicate over them because they would be isolated. If you look at these, you know, like Rig Approach wasn't a police station. It was on a trading estate. It was yeah. a depot. Finchley was the same. It, it was a, a workshop. It was um, a garage, you know, um, a mechanics workshop uh, for the police. And, and they were based there. So they were, they were separate away. Like the National Crime Squad are now. A lot of these are, are, are on trading estates. So they're not accountable to, to the normal policing thing. They're not accountable. And, and the culture... And let, me, the let with... me just shake the people. Uh, John, John, let me just shake the people. This is a really important point. You know, there's a lot of people in the States and all who, you know, that we t- won't understand yeah. completely. But the Flying Squad was set up back in the day because it was one of, the, one of the ones that was set up that could go anywhere and didn't have boundaries. That was the whole idea yeah. of the Flying Squad in the first place, right? That they was unaccountable. They was like over in the States, there was the Untouchables, Elliot Ness, kind of, but the UK version, right? Well, well, also, I mean, they're, they're there to, for, for the cash. So it's the post offices and the banks. So they're going to get a, a lot of um, corporate funding from, from these departments, like the City of London Police. I mean, they got so much corporate funding. But for me, the real crime was abuse of children, mm-hmm. which was totally, totally and utterly underlooked. It was seen as a, a job for lactating women returning from maternity leave and uh, given absolutely zero resources. But you were dealing with people raping children and murdering children. Whereas, do you know what? If you look now, what do the banks do, Stephen? You know, how many people have committed suicide because they can't pay their mortgage? How many people have been made homeless? I couldn't give a toss for the banks. I, you know, I'm not denigrating um, good police work, Right. And, and, you know, you can't have people running around the streets with sawn-off shotguns, you know, because inevitably, and it sounds, you know, stupid to say, but someone's going to get hurt. And at some point, so, and, and we had the case of um, that guy Hurley who shot um, a police officer uh, where I am in Hemel Hempstead, you know, and it was an off-duty copper. And, and um, back in 1986, I think, he unloaded a, a shotgun into him and killed him. So you, you can't go doing that, but I would never want, to police the banks, they can get stuffed. I I ended up um, on, a, on an unbelievable little unit, and I on, on vice clubs and vice unit. But I investigated casino crime, and again, I didn't give a toss for the for the casinos because they were abhorrent places that destroyed exploiting, lives. Exploiting everyone, John. Exploiting. Right? It's the same as <coughs> betting shops. They destroy lives. You know, they, these aren't benevolent places. These are places that that are just financially parasitic and they and then this is why i don't like it when you get a lot of these celebrities now that, that have earned a lot of money i mean barbara windsor was one of them and there's been a few others that do these adverts for, for bingo and for gambling sites you know what are you doing working class heroes going on there promoting these these gambling things you know where's their shame they shouldn't be doing it but um you know when so when i was at the west end there were this Real hardcore, and they were, <coughs> they were no nonsense hardcore individuals. And if you got in their way, you got a good smashing. And um, you never really knew what they were doing because they had their own elite little club. Mm. And unofficially, I mean, the, the Flying School actually did have their own secret society. Yeah, you say about the, that. It's called That's the Winkle Club. The Winkle yeah. Club. Yeah, you tell me about yeah. it. It's unbelievable. And, and they would all have a, a little, um, like shell, a Winkle shell, you know. Because the winkle's like a little um, sea mollusk thing, and they'd have a shell in their pocket. And when they went out drinking or whatever, if you didn't have your winkle shell on you, you had to buy everyone drinks and and all this. And then they had their own little ritual. 
So, um, you, you know, you, you always, again, you get these wheels within the wheels. And, of course, also you get secret societies. Like a secret um, society. And then we've got the Masons, yeah. of course. But, you know, these are these are more examples of these tight-knit groups, right? Secret yeah, I societies. Mean, ma- masonry was when I, I never really understood it until I got into the CID. And then I started to find out what masonry was and how many people were, were in it. And a lot of the older ones were masons. A lot of people who had quite a privileged life and would go from job to job to job were masons. A lot of the specialist detective units were predominantly masons. You know, so there was, um, you know, an old boys network. And, and I can always remember my, my detective sergeant, he was the ex flying squad guy. And I, I was always putting in for different... I'd never stay anywhere long. I'd stay a year, two years, and I'd want to move on somewhere else. And um, if ever I went for an interview, they'd, they'd call it a board. You'd go for an interview board. And you needed to know all the legislation and everything about this job you're going for. Um, even if you didn't get it, you still had to, you know, hours of research. And, and you never knew what questions they were going to ask. And he said to me, what job are you going for? And I said, I'm going for this one. And he just picked up the phone. And he got me all the answers straight away, you know, and said, right, that's what they're going to ask you. This is what you've got to do. You answer this, this and this, but you probably ain't going to get this job because it's already gone anyway. But the next time you go for it, you're going to get it. And it was, that was said to me. And it wasn't the first time I got that. So it's all red, it's all work. old boys, old boys, old boys network, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, we had, we had a superintendent there, or he might have been a chief inspector. And, um, he'd been under investigation because he was charging, he was in charge of the custody suite, right? And he was charging people for bail. So if they wanted bail, they had to pay him. Unbelievable. And uh, he was investigated and he got off with it, you know? And again, come about, I'm going to give you an example. Um, We went round once, we were told, right, go out there and get get us some work. Go and find something because it's a quiet day. And I came across a block of flats and all the windows had been blacked out and it stunk of cannabis. So I called it and I said, look, something's going on in here. And growing farms had just started uh, picking up, you know? And uh, so we called it in and the, the, the two detective sergeants were in the pub. They've been on there since um, about three in the afternoon now. They've been in this pub since midday. So they said, right, go and get a warrant, kick the door in. Okay, so we went into the court, got a warrant. And then, and then they said, send a car around to the pub, pick us up. So a car had to go around, pick these two up. They were pissed out their heads. And we did a warrant. Well, I'm not going to disclose what got on, but it was appalling what went on. It was absolutely appalling. And, you know, it's one of them. He was, he was bad enough sober, but now he's off his head. And, um, oh, it was just carnage. Carnage, you know. And a little tiny bit of spliff was found. And um, the bloke boarded the windows up. Um, because he'd been robbed and the people were looking through and he was smoking cannabis he had a terminal illness and uh, yeah. and uh, you know oh it was it ended up in a big civil case that did because the fellow got serious head injuries I bet it was madness Pure so madness. John look you know that's unbelievable I mean you know for normal people who don't they would not understand this right so thanks for that now look when you went on to Vice now Right. Yeah. You know, we've passed that the organised crime thing. Right. When he went on to Vice, where there's some very unbelievably right. nasty things happening to vulnerable children and all that. This is when it really went wrong. Now, this is this yeah, is yeah. this is bad. A bad area. Just get straight to it. What was well, the okay. bad I, things you I were mean, saying about I, the corruption I, and bad people I, being protected there, John? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, what one of the things I will say just before I move on. There's something that I forgot to mention. What was another time on a tradition called the happy kit, and the what happy the happy kit, kit was, yeah. it'd be in a drawer. Everyone was expected to keep a happy kit. Um, I'm not saying I did. Again, you know, it's up to people's inference on that one. And a happy kit consisted of a bit of cannabis, a knife. Uh, it couldn't be. Uh, it had to be like a lock knife, so it was illegal. And there were three choices that someone could be given, right? Um, They were either offered the cannabis. No, they don't want the cannabis. Right, you're having a knife. Well, no, I'm not having a knife because it's it's an offensive weapon, you know, that'll go down as weapons on their things. So then if they didn't have any of them, they'd get what's called nonced. 
So um, they'll, they'll get told that a WPC will be brought in, so, right, you just squeezed her tits, right? Okay, so we're going to announce you. Uh, so then they go, right, all right, I'll take the cannabis. So they take the cannabis. So, again, I'm not saying I'll witness this. I'm not saying anything, but, draw, you know, again, you... Take but, your that was called inference a happy, from that, right? The inference okay. from that, but it was called a happy kit. But I ended up um, uh, going to Vice. Now, what had happened is I'd, I, I'd been offered a, a, a job, and it was tracking down transient paedophiles. And it was looking at um, sex offenders that had failed to register and just gone missing. So circa 1997, they brought in, they started really clamping down on sex offenders. And they realised that, you know, these people were, were a threat, for the first time really, were a threat to society and were organised. And they started using a lot of psychology and profiling in. So I got offered a job with the River Police, based at Wapping, um, mm -hmm. to go round and look at um, how many paedophiles were living on canal boats because there was info from the prisons that if you live on a canal boat, you ain't going to get touched by the police. Kids like canals, kids like boats. There's going to be one. And I was told there's a couple in London, a couple of pedos are living on boats. Um, go, and, go and find them. Uh, rattle, rattle their cage a little bit because I was used to recruit informants because I had a, a good natural way of communicating and... From a very early in my career, they realised that I was good, but people would talk to me. So I started getting used um, to, to recruit informants. I'd go into prisons. I'd, uh, the immigration service used me. The intelligence service used me. And, I, I, you know, and it, it was very dangerous as well because it nearly cost me my life, um, which I'll, I'll come on to a bit later, you know. But um, anyway, so I was going out there and, and tracking down the paedophiles. And... I'd never really taken any interest in, um, in child abuse or anything like that until I started doing the work for the um, paedophile unit and then start realising how devious these people were. But not only how devious they were, I started then interacting with victims of child abuse. And I realised that a lot of people in prison have come from abuse. There was a, a, a massive correlation between people that are socially dysfunctional, damaged people, angry people, aggressive people that had come from their inception as, as, as not just sexual abuse, but childhood trauma. And it had never really been looked at properly as a way of making society a better place. They would, again, rather chase around armed robbers, you know, nicking money off banks and banks kill people anyway, then, then, then deal with people that were sexually abusing kids and of course, the suicide rates, the heroin addiction, it, the social problems attributed to, to, to abuse, it just, we'll never know. We'll never know. Um, anyway, so I was given a few months, go and see if we can find two more pedos. Well, within a couple of months, I found 90, 90. It was incredible. Wow. But information started coming on uh, about boats uh, moored in, on sort of towards, um, what's that? County Surrey, uh, the, the 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 River Thames towards Surrey. There were quite affluent people with boats there. There was um, inferences regarding certain politicians, people that that were influential in social services, that were part of a paedophile ring. Um, there was a group called Pi, Paedophile Information Exchange, which was um, a, a political group that was set up uh, pro paedophile campaigners to reduce the age of sexual consent between a man and a boy. To, I think it was to about um, four years old or something ridiculous like that. It, but they had the backing of the Labour Party. But there were members of this group that were living on boats. Um, that it was honestly, it was linking in all over. It was got so big. And because it got so big, I was removed. So I was dragged in by a senior officer and I was told, look, you're not looking into this anymore. Right now, it, I set a model for how you, you, you do field intelligence on this work, which was so successful, it's still used today, right? But they shut it all down, and I was Why? sanctioned. Why, John? Why did they well, shut well, it down? Well, well the, the reason I was given... it's so successful. Yeah, the reason I was given was that I was on a secondment, and they couldn't afford to second me anymore, right? And then when I pushed it, and I, I, you know, I made a fuss about it, 
I was taken to one side by a chief inspector and he said, look, I'm going to tell you now, John, it's come from high up and the cage has been rattled. And then I was approached by um, uh, a very senior detective, um, one of the first paedophile hunters, a really, really clever, wise, old, wily detective that his, his passion was paedophiles and, and, and banging them up. And, um, and he turned around and said, John, you, you need to understand something. When you get good at police work, you know, all of a sudden you'll find your career just explodes, you know, and you're promoted and, you know, you do extremely well and you have a good life. However, um, when you get good at investigating paedophiles, the opposite happens, right? And I would go to intelligence meetings with this guy and we would go to intelligence meetings with um, the military intelligence units, uh, the um, post office had an intelligence unit, the travel industry have an intelligence unit, and it's all to do with paedophiles, everyone's sharing information. And I, and I got to understand how paedophiles work and how connected they are, you know, and why they do it, you know, and how devious they are. Um, so it, it came down to the fact and the matter is, I was then told that you become too good at what you're doing. Your name's getting mentioned high up in Scotland Yard and the line's been drawn under your, your curtailing your activities. Um, so off you, off you jog, Mr. Wedger. And, um, and that's what I was told. That, and then I was told any job you want, let us know. It'll be facilitated. Right. So again, it, it, uh, any job I wanted. So ordinarily you'd have to, uh, show an interest, go on a secondment. Yeah. Uh, you'd have Jump to do all, right? all of that. All yeah, of that. All, yeah. All of that. And you've got no people and everything else. And the vice unit come out and the vice unit was an elite unit. Very, very sexy job to have. You were almost guaranteed global travel. Um, and it was just, you know, once you're there, you become specialised and you ain't going to leave there. You know, you, you, and you'll get a job in the private sector as well, you know, a, a well-paid job. So early on, you know, I ended up getting this job. But again, that came through a phone call being put in um, by, by a senior officer saying, look, I've got this lad here, good guy. He needs this job. And then he was told pen and paper. Yeah, it, it's on loudspeaker. Get a pen and paper. So he gets a pen and paper. And then all the questions with all the answers. And then it was passed over to me and said, right, make sure you answer them and that job's yours. Well, of course, I got it, right? I got that job. And I started working with um, child prostitutes. People don't like that term, but I'm, you know, I was there to protect kids. So I'm not going to do anything to denigrate a kid. But that's what they were called. And that was it. I was almost called the Tom Squad, the prostitute squad. Um, and... You know, they, they were little kids. They were working the street. This was like something out of um, that film Mona Lisa, you know? It's like Dickensian London. And I can remember once we were out in the street and there was a, a girl there. She was very underweight, underfed, a crack addict. They were all on crack cocaine, all from the care system, these children. She's 14 years old and she's there uh, and she's rattling, you know, because she's not got a heroin or a crack. She's out in the street. She's obviously being pimped as well. And um, we we pick her up, right? And she gets treated as a victim. And the next thing I get a call through um, saying, right, let her go. Because this girl had scabies, right? So they said, if you bring her in, she's going to take the car off the road. Social services are notoriously bad at turning up um, and would take hours and hours. And on the really, social services couldn't give a toss for these kids. Um and then she'll end up infecting the car. The car's got to be removed and deep cleaned. You take her back to the Nick. We'll have to get the whole um, little suite we put them in. They used to let the kids smoke in the police station as well. You know, these kids were allowed to smoke. And they said, that's got to all be uh, defumigated. Um, just, just fuck her off, get rid of her. So what is the, what is the, look, you know, I mean, this is terrible treatment, you know, of a minor, of a vulnerable person, right? It's as simple as that. So, okay. What is the what is the option to uh, well, well, again? You know to help her with with the duty of care. Yeah. Well, the thing is, what what needs to be made clear is these are kids that, that are highly traumatized with a massive distrust of authority. So they're not going to be nice kids, right? Yeah. 
they're, they're going to be horrible. But that doesn't swell. matter when we're talking about someone uh, of who course. really should, yeah, of and course. the duty of care, right? Yeah, yeah, of course, and that's what the police are there for. So if the police turn their back on them, well, there is there is nowhere where else to go. Do you know what Absolutely, I mean? Absolutely, John. And this is my job to turn them back. So what is and, the, what is the option? Well, 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 well the option the then, option here please. is that girl goes back on the street. The next bloke who puts his cock inside her. Let's be raw about this. He's committing statutory rape. And if you want to deal with indictable offences, you've got a child rapist. That's thirty years, right? But no, they don't see that. They see it the fact is she's going to take a car off the road. You could go out and nick 10 prostitutes, which are going to get a 50 quid fine, be back on the street within 20 minutes, you know, but it's all to do with figures. But what what, what happened, Stephen, is, is quite ironic that there was this undercurrent of this child prostitution racket that was going on. Now, they had the organised brothels, now, the cops would go and they would deal with the organised brothels. Rarely would you find an under-18. It did happen, but usually they were 16, 17. Um, usually foreign girls have been brought over. And again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but they they would, would go for these brothels because there was the proceeds of Crime Act to come out, POCA, right? Now, they weren't interested in the kids' device unit, but when you investigate these brothels, that make a huge amount of money, right? You're going to have a proceeds of crime investigation. So that means that the person running that brothel is going to have property. And they're not only going to have property in this country, they're going to have it abroad. So you're going to have the power to seize it abroad. So that means, what's a cop are going to get tasked with? Going out to Cyprus to go yeah. and seize a property. Going, yeah. out to, going out to Thailand to <clears> seize <throat> a property. And of course, back then, they got, they got flown first class. But there is no proceeds of crime from a girl who's been pimped up by another crackhead on the street, you know, in Hackney or in King's Cross or wherever. I I got asked to look into an allegation. This is where it really turns dark. I got asked to look into an allegation made by a 14-year-old girl that she's been pimped out um, in the Paddington area, Sussex Gardens, a very notorious area for um, for prostitution in, um, in, in, in central... West, West London, right? Um, and again, there's always a reason. A geographical profile, there's always a reason why. And this had a big transient population of builders, uh, white vans, there's cheap hotels. And these hotels would, would rent out their rooms for an hour at a time, right? Um, by their night porters, unofficially. A lot of the night porters were um, crack users. And these girls were all being pimped out by one woman. It was a prostitute herself, a street prostitute, very well known. The police knew for well over a decade that this woman had involvement with young girls and had access to young girls. And these girls had all come from, um, she was a drug dealer as well. So they're all clients, the children of clients. So she's, she's selling with her enforcer guy, a Jamaican guy. They were selling crack, heroin, um, everything else. She was whoring herself. But, um, so... The people she was selling drugs to, she had access to their children. She'd get their children involved because people would pay a lot of money for a kid. So she was trading these little kids out. Um, she would take them to a crack house and the kid would be swapped for an hour for a load of rocks of crack. So that was her drugs for the night, right? And, and to sell them. And then the kid could then be taken to a Mayfair, a Curzon Street upmarket Arab restaurant and traded for two grand, Right. And she had access to so many kids, right? And the police had known a long time. Now, this girl had made allegations on many occasions. And because she was what we used to class as scroty, she was mouthy um, from the care homes, right? They said she's, she's probably a liar. She's a pain in the ass. Just go and speak to her. But I went and spoke to her and I believed her, right? And... We built up a rapport. There was a, a bridge of trust was built. And she said, if you believe me, I'll, I'll show you so many other girls. And she did. She introduced me to more and more. And in the end, there was two of us working on this. We had dozens and dozens of these young kids. They were on crack cocaine and heroin. They were being traded out. Some of these little kids, you know, they ranged from nine years old to 14 years old. Some of them had HIV. 
syphilis, um, contagious tuberculosis, all occupational hazards. So they, they, these, these were um, diseases, contagious, life-threatening diseases. They're picked up because of their lifestyle, right? Now, the social services said it was, it was a chosen lifestyle. Kids can't acquiesce to this lifestyle. They're surviving in the environment they've been put in. And that's all they were doing. And, John, look, but what, look, look, this is um, shocking. It's absolutely shocking. And I have to say, even for me, people know me, I'm even finding this interview hard. This part here is difficult because I have children of some of the ages you're talking about. And I yeah. know a lot of people. And it's, I am actually, there's parts of that, what you're saying, that I'm finding it hard, really. That's the truth. Yeah. Well, 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 what what we got this with is it, Stephen? Fucking shocking, right? What I yeah. want to know, because look, 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 you know, because we're going to go on, because you was vilifying after this for trying yeah, yeah. to protect well, well, this is, these vulnerable. This is you know, slowly, children. I'm so, slowly. What was done about it, though, John? What was done well, about well, it? You well, know, well, so there's all well, this stuff. We got it. What was done about it? Well, what what happened? Firstly, I had to make the police officially aware of what was going on. So social services have come to us and said, look. We've known about this a long time. We've gone to the police because the police is compartmentalised, right? So certain units will get Absolutely. certain disciplines and remits. And with sexual offences, you've got to be trained, and rightly so. So only the vice unit would be able to deal with child prostitution. This is absolutely shocking that this kind of stuff will be going on. But we know, you know, an underbelly, and people know we live in cities, but... It's still shocking to actually hear it, you know. Uh, you was threatened as well, weren't you, John? Tell us about that. Well, well what happened was I, I, I put a report on about what was going on. So I pieced everything together, a very concise, very factually based report of this underbelly, this criminality involving children and the sex trade that's going on. Now, I put this report in hoping that the right thing would be done that we get the right resources. Bear in mind, there's two of us. I mean, we're going on about the flying squad with all their cars and whatnot. There's two of us dealing with kids in this horrific, life-threatening situation. We didn't even have a car between us, you know. We used to travel on buses most of the time. And um, and and what happened was I was brought before the senior officer. So a detective chief uh, superintendent dragged me in, and this is what he said to me. He sat me down, and he said, you know what, John? You're so well liked here. You're, you're, you're one of my top two detectives I've got in the unit. And he said, but let me tell you now, if you mention a word about what you've exposed, you are going to lose your home, your children and your job. You've got no idea how deep this goes. If you mention a word of it, you will be thrown to the wolves and there's nothing I can do. You've no idea what and who you're dealing with. You must shut the fuck up. And that's what he said to me. And that was a threat, a monumental direct threat. And then hopefully I can go on at a later point and tell me because every threat he gave me, it came true. They tried to take my children off me. They tried to um, uh, put me in prison on nine occasions um, and, and then sack me. And then I never got paid for nearly three years. Um, so every single threat, which meant I nearly lost my home. And that's because... I refuse to shut my mouth. Now, John, look, you know, we're going to end it there, but let me say, look, I think you're incredibly brave. I know that you are. And as I've said, look, it takes a lot for me, obviously, a lot of people know about my history, but I found the second part of that interview, you're talking about the children, difficult, right? Absolutely fucking shocking, right? Now, um, we're not saying that all police are bad. When you look no. at it, we need police. We need to maintain law so to protect people, so there's fairness. We know the higher it goes, there's a lot of corruption, but we know that there's also a lot of bad darkness out there that needs to be exposed and it can't be condoned, period, right? Yep. So people can draw their influence from that. You know, it's for the, for the viewers out there and people, but my, my thing is to give them fascinating people like you and really get into the raw content, the real truth, and it's down to them. They can take the inference, you know, from that. I mean, I personally know, you know, you've got a foundation now. You know, you've left the police force now. You go on, you, you know, I know you're very active 
now in campaigning and working with people to still help children and other people. We're going we're gonna to keep that one, yeah. you know, for another time. Uh, because this interview has been so serious and so hard hitting, I want to leave it there for the right reasons. Right? Yeah, I agree. For the right okay. reasons. But look, listen, John, thanks a lot today for coming on and uh, on the big shift and sharing, uh, sharing your story. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, guys, to a wonderful new segment of The Big Shift with Stephen Gillen. Make sure to subscribe, like, go into stephengillen.com and sign up for more wonderful content to expedite, help and support you on your own personal journey of success.